All right. Well, uh, hello and welcome to our lightning talk session. My name is Ben Edelman. I'm a CAR-T researcher here at the Texas A&M Transportation Institute. Um, and I will be moderating uh, the session, which is going to provide uh, 12 exceptional researchers from across the country with the ability to share work they are conducting in the area of transportation, air quality, and health. Um, our presenters will deliver quick five minute presentations of their posters immediately following the session, which concludes at 1.30 central, we'll hold the poster session, which will uh, go from 1.30 to two. During the poster session, attendees will have the opportunity to video chat with presenters and discuss posters in a group setting. Um, and we'll provide instructions on how to join the poster session at the conclusion of this event. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to our first presenter, Fuad Noor from the University of California, Riverside. Thank you. Uh, hello and welcome everyone to our presentation. Um, this work is on the current state of off-road construction equipment electrification and it's uh, done as part of a card funded project. Uh, there are uh, numerous types of construction equipment and we have looked into the population and emission inventories from CARD's off-road 2017 database uh, to select the major population and emission contributors. We've also um, pointed out uh, the equipment types and that have uh, low population but have significantly higher emissions, such as the scrapers and off highway trucks. Uh, replacing this tax with uh, electric tech uh, would help us to um, reduce emissions significantly. We have seen uh, different uh, types of electrification in the construction equipment arena, and uh, electrification provides uh, um, the um, usual um, advantages of higher efficiency, uh, lower fuel consumption and noise, and flexible design. For construction equipment, however, the uh, emission reduction and noise reduction provide significant operational flexibility near a population centers. Um, as uh, there are different electrification uh, approaches for different equipment types, we have also seen different uh, regeneration techniques uh, employed at the different implements of the uh, equipment. For example, uh, boom and swing uh, of the excavators. It also became apparent that uh, different types received more um, uh, electrification research uh, than the others. For example, there are uh, commercial diesel electric off highway trucks available right now, and the excavators also received significant research attention. However, this is not the same for many other equipment types, and they need uh, immediate research attention. As the market Phase right now, we have uh, different diesel electric hybrid and even uh, cable battery electric equipment available. We also have uh, quite a few uh, battery electric compact equipment and at the component level, we have uh, some uh, high performance electric motors on the market. Uh, we have also seen um, other types of equipment um, uh, employing different types of electrification uh, across different types. And uh, if this trend continues, we can hope to have uh, more uh, construction equipment types uh, in the commercial market employing different types of electrification techniques. We can also see some innovative approaches for uh, charging, such as mobile chargers, to address the uh, infrastructure issues. There exist uh, quite a few um, barriers for uh, construction equipment electrification, including short range and long charging time. For construction equipment, we're also facing the inadequacy of uh, charging infrastructure, as well as the high cost of the electric versions of these equipment. Uh, there are multiple potential solutions for each of these concerns, and uh, future work can uh, contribute significantly in this sector. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much, Fouad. We appreciate it. Uh, next, we have Shams Tanver from California Polytechnic State University, um, and he's going to be presenting on uh, can battery electric trucks replace conventional heavy duty trucks used in port drayage operation? Go ahead, Shams. Thank you. I hope you can see my screen. Um, so Ben had already introduced the topic that I'm going to present. and. Um, this is a work that I have started when I was a research engineer with CSERT um, at University of California, Riverside. So Fuad, Kanok, and Ziming are the collaborators on this study. 
the work started with the motivation that in California, um, the problem of emissions from heavy duty vehicles is, is really a problematic one. So although 7% of the greenhouse gas emissions comes from uh, heavy duty vehicles, 33% of the total NOx emissions are coming out of these this vehicles. So one of the potential solution that uh, the different agencies uh, have thought about is introduction of electric trucks, right? So the problem with electric trucks right now, it's the problem with the range limitation. But uh, in case for the drage operation where we are moving uh, goods and items from the port to the different warehouses, they have limited daily mileage and most of them return to the home base and there is a lot of creeping and transient operation involved in this kind of drainage operation that kind of makes it a suitable candidate for electrification so what we looked at um, in this process is that we tried to answer several questions and i, I want to kind of give you uh, a um, an initial um, view of what's our findings so what we found that using the current vehicle battery and charging technology more than 11 percent of the tours um, that we had uh, analyzed that was infeasible to be served with a uh, electric truck um, system. So those were out of the range. And what that means is that if at using the current technology, if a drage operator wants to convert their entire fleet to electric trucks, they would still need to have some additional conventional diesel trucks to serve the that remaining 11% of the tools. And that is going to increase the cost of overall operation of the DRACE facility. Uh, so there, there is potential to use some other zero emission trucks such as fuel cells and others. And also uh, we looked at the, the effect of opportunity charging at the home base. So we looked at the time when these trucks were resting at their depot uh, or their home base location. And when we saw that how much charging that we can give to this truck in this uh, resting period. And we found that um, if we do opportunity charging at home base, that would increase the level of tour completion by 20%. And um, we also found that most of the charging times that were coinciding with the peak demand hour for the charging. So there needs to be some more policies that gears to us shifting these charging times to more um, off-peak period times where the charging load is as, not as much high. And the third thing we found that improving the scheduling and the routing for this whole drage truck operation, we can significantly increase the efficiency of the overall uh, electric truck fleet system. So there needs to be more investigation to understand how to integrate the information that we get about the charging behavior and the type of activities of these trucks to kind of improve the system, including the understanding of range fluctuation and temperature rise and drops. So let's take a look at some of the ways that we have analyzed. So we have defined our data in drage tours. So what tour mean if a trip started from a home base and it visited multiple destination on its way and came back all the way to home, that's include considered as a tool. And, and the consideration that we had in this study is that the, all the charging that can only happen at the home base, the other locations were not uh, equipped with charging facilities. And we looked at four different scenarios. The first scenario is um, all the tours start with 100% charge. The second scenario is all the tours uh, start with 100% charge in the beginning of the week but the tools actually, uh, it continue to serve until the batteries run out. The third one is um, there is opportunity charging mechanism when they were coming back to their home base. And the fourth one is we are doing all sort of realignment and reassignment until uh, we have all the feasible tours are completed. So taking a look at this, uh, plot here, we see if the fraction on Y axis, we have the fraction of battery consumed and X axis, we have the tour distance. And we saw about uh, 150 miles is the range that we found in most of the tours that, that can be served using this current battery and um, vehicle technology. And when we added the opportunity charging at the home base, we saw the number of tours that can be completed um, 
that uh, changed from on average from 2.6 tours to 3.6 tours and about uh, the percentage of tours that can be accommodated extra was increased by 20 percent and because of the efficiency gain from reassignment of these trucks we found that uh, with only 14 trucks, the entire feasible operation of this fleet operator that has about 38 trucks can be replaced. And that is a huge efficiency gain in terms of the cost uh, of operation and the cost of maintaining this facility. We also looked at the sensitivity with respect to battery size. So the existing, the previous slide was based on 250 kilowatt hour battery size. And if we look at the different lines in this plot is that with increasing battery size, we could accommodate more and more number of tours and the percentage of trip completion was uh, much more improved. So what we have to be on the lookout for in the future is that how this um, reduced cost of battery and increased size of battery in those different truck facilities can help improve us the entire operation of the race facility. So with that, I would like to conclude my presentation. Thank you, Shams. We, appreciate, you, Shams. we appreciate it. So we'll be transitioning to our next presenter, which is Kent Johnson from the University of California, Riverside. Uh, Kent will be presenting uh, the development and application of a micro PEMS system for onboard sensing, analysis, and reporting. Kent? Thank you, Ben. Um, yes, so the title, uh, Onboard Sensing, Analysis, and Reporting, this does match with ARB's real, which is real emissions assessment logging. The, the idea is going forward with large data being available, we can actually start to look at the inventory in real time. So there's this really exciting transition in the uh, emissions world where we're gonna start measuring the emissions from vehicles all the time on the vehicle itself. And it's it's partly because of the development of some of the sensing that we've had for about the last 15, 20 years. Those sensors have gotten so robust that we can actually use them for compliance, inventory, and inspection maintenance programs. Why is onboard sensing so important? The, the duty cycle, as we all know, the, the diesel engine, uh, just we just don't know how it works in the real world. We try to certify it in a laboratory and we come up with different cycles, but industry is, is so unique. It, it always responds to a need and that need changes all the time. So we're, we're just not going to be able to understand our inventory well without measuring the vehicle's emissions in real time. The other problem is we've, we've got defeat devices out there. We've got um, deterioration. And so how do those emissions look once the vehicle's out on the road? So with this new concept of monitoring the emissions in real time, we can actually have an assessment of what's going on and actually really start to promote uh, electrification. Where would it be best to put it? Look at the disadvantaged community. Where are these trucks actually operating? You talk about big data, you combine in these onboard sensors with all of the uh, meteorological data, maybe uh, demographic data, population data, and you can start to really easily see where best to mitigate things. So it's it's a pretty exciting time. Um, where the sensor actually gets located, uh, currently they're integrated into any design of an engine that's a diesel. Um, the concept here is we wanna separate a little bit for some of the evaluation side. So we wanna add a different set of sensors on these trucks in high volume, they're really low cost, uh, and let them sit there for years and then collect this data in like a mission control center. It's currently being done in Singapore and other countries and in China. I think China is up to about 50,000 sensors on different trucks, and they're able to manage and out, send out compliance in uh, enforcement. And ultimately, when you look at the concept, um, we can really pull this all back together where we pull in air quality, demographics, decision-making, GIS, uh, metrology, and then we can run these line source models, bring in the onboard sensing data, and not only can we see what's happening, but we can also feed back to the engine. So let's say there's a, a certain community that you're driving into, your car is about to need a regen. Well, we could, we could actually postpone that regen until you're outside of that sensitive community, especially if the volume of traffic's there. So, 
Um, please come by and take a look at the poster. Uh, there's a lot more information than can be shared in this one poster. And, and this, this concept has been going on for about five years, but it wasn't until about two years ago where it really started to take hold, not only from the agency's perspective, but industry sees the benefit in it as well, because if, if they can show what their engines are really doing, we can start to put the effort where it's needed and not necessarily always just going after one source because it's an easy source. So thank you. Thank you so much, Kent, appreciate that. So now we'll be moving to our next presenter, which is Ayla Moretti from the University of California, Riverside as well. Um, and she'll be presenting a presentation called Bridging Model Estimates of Vehicular Emissions with Near Roadway Ambient Measurements. Ayla? Thank you, Ben. Hello, my, Hello. Name, my is name is Ayla, Ayla, and today I'll be doing my lightning talk on bridging model estimates of vehicle emissions with near roadway ambient measurements. So studies are finding that emission simulators are not accurately predicting near road PM. This could be due to emission simulators being unable to account for the gas to particle partitioning that occurs as vehicle emissions rapidly dilute and cool in the ambient atmosphere. So PM can either be inorganic or organic, with the organic PM often referred to as organic aerosol or OA. And many studies have shown that a majority of the PM emitted from on-road gasoline and diesel vehicles is semi-volatile OA. So this means that it behaves differently than the non-volatile PM, such as elemental carbon. So this OA undergoes gas to particle partitioning. So this figure, shows the gas to particle partitioning and shows an example of how it could vary with the different methods of measuring vehicle emissions, such as the Portable Emission Measurement System, or PEMS, and the chassis dyno in series with a constant volume sampler or dilution tunnel. So as vehicle emissions are emitted, they consist of gases, semi-volatile partitioning OA, and non-volatile PM. Then as they are emitted into the ambient atmosphere, they rapidly dilute and cool, which leads to the changes in the semi-volatile partitioning OA. So as the exhaust is emitted, the plume rapidly cools, which leads to the condensation of semi-volatile organic gases into OA, and that is shown here. So as you can see, there's less gases since they have condensed onto the orange OA particle, leading to an increase of size of the particle. However, the plume also dilutes which leads to the evaporation of OA into semi-volatile organic gases, which is then shown here. So you can see that the size of the orange OA particle has decreased due to this evaporation. So this research utilizes a thermodynamic model that accounts for the gas to particle partitioning to improve the prediction of PM2.5 as a function of temperature and dilution ratio, while also accounting for the varying measurement strategies such as the PEMS and dilution tunnel, in order to provide a correction factor that can be applied to emission simulators to better predict near road PM 2.5. So this is one figure from my poster, and it shows how the sampling dilution ratio of a PEMS affects the correction factor when the sampling temperature is held constant at 60 degrees Celsius and the ambient temperature at 25 degrees Celsius. So a quick note on reading this figure, when the correction factor or color bar value is above one, this means that the traditional approach, which is the traditional approach used by emission simulators, is underestimating the near road PM. However, when the correction factor is below one, this means that the traditional approach is overestimating the near road PM. So in this figure, we can see that the lowest total dilution ratios which corresponds to closest to the vehicle, we can see that the traditional approach is underestimating the predicted near road PM. However, as we move further away from the vehicle, as the total dilution ratio increases, we can see that the traditional approach starts to overestimate the predicted near road PM as that correction factor drops below one. 
So come visit my poster to learn more about how the correction factor of gasoline and diesel vehicles differ and how the sampling temperature and dilution ratio affects the correction factor, as well as how the vehicle's EC to TC ratio, the distance from the vehicle or roadway, and the ambient temperature and background PM also plays a role with the correction factor. So thank you for your time and I hope to see you at my poster. Thank you so much, Ayla, we appreciate it. So now we'll move on to our next presenter who is George Scora from the University of California, Riverside as well. Um, his presentation will be on the effects of route selection on in-use NOx emissions from heavy duty, uh, from heavy duty diesel trucks. George? Hi, my name is George Scora and my lightning talk is on the effects of route selection on in-use NOx emissions from heavy duty diesel trucks. Heavy duty trucks are a critical component of goods movement in the US. However, they consume a large amount of fuel and emit a significant amount of emissions, namely CO2, PM, and NOx. As can be seen in the mobile source inventory chart, according to 2015 data, heavy duty trucks account for 37% of NOx in the South Coast Air Basin, which has some of the worst air quality in the nation. To help re reduce contributions to the NOx emission inventory, NOx emission standards for heavy duty diesel trucks have become increasingly more stringent over the years, a trend that continues with California's recently approved low NOx regulation. So to meet the 2010 NOx emission standards, most diesel engine manufacturers use selective catalytic reduction or SCR technology. In an SCR system, a liquid reducing agent is injected into the exhaust prior to the SCR catalyst to convert NOx into nitrogen and water. SCR performance is highly dependent on the temperature of the catalyst as is shown in the example graph of the conversion efficiency of an SCR catalyst. Typically, the SCR needs to be at least 200 degrees Celsius for significant NOx conversion efficiency to occur. It has been found that SCR temperature is influenced by vehicle activity and that during low load activity, SCR temperature may drop below optimal operating temperatures for the catalyst. This reduces SCR NOx conversion performance. The objective of this work is to manage heavy duty diesel activity via route choice in order to control for activity that leads to decreased NOx emissions. The routing methodology proposed in this work uses standard routing algorithms to calculate a number of top candidate routes across a roadway network. The NOx contribution of the candidate routes is then determined by modeling link emissions for each link on the route and then summing NOx link emissions across each route. NOx link emissions are a function of a distance-based mass emission rate at a fully warm operating temperature, the length of the link, and the temperature correction factor based on the estimated temperature of the catalyst at each link. A key component of the routing system are the emission rates that are used to estimate link emissions. An emission rate lookup table was developed that associates emission rates in units of grams per mile with a wide range of speeds, vehicle weights, and road grades. These emission rates are based on emission rates in EPA's Motor Vehicle Emission Simulator MOVES model and the representative cycles for heavy duty diesels that the MOVES model provides. MOVES rates are converted to gram per mile emission rates by calculating operating mode distributions for a combination of MOVES cycles and across a range of vehicle weights and road grades. MOVES emission rates are then applied to the operating mode distributions to generate a gram per mile emission rate for each parameter combination. The final emission lookup interpolates between bounding emission rates based on this average speed value. The temperature correction factor for the link emission rate is based on the estimated SCR temperature and the known conversion efficiency at that temperature. This relationship is shown in the top equation and in this equation, the emission rate at 300 degrees Celsius is considered the standard emission rate with a sufficiently warmed up and normally operating SCR catalyst. The SCR temperature is estimated based on the SCR temperature from the previous link and link characteristics as shown in the bottom multiple linear regression equation. This equation was calibrated with 260 hours of data from a heavy duty diesel truck similar to the test vehicles. 
Field testing was performed using two closely matched heavy-duty trucks equipped with data loggers and following competing routes with the same origin and destination points. The routes were run concurrently and four pairs of routes were tested. The image at the bottom shows one of these route pairs. NOx emission values were based on the ECU NOx sensor data and were compared with results from the NOx routing method developed for this project. So some of the key points from the field testing are that the routing method was able to correctly predict the NOx, the low NOx route in each case. And this is true even though the low NOx route was not always the quickest route or the shortest route. And the results also show that the lowest NOx routes had the highest fuel consumption in all cases. This could be explained by higher fuel routes running hotter and having better SCR conversion performance. For more information, please visit the poster. Thank you, George. Appreciate that. And with that, we will move on to our next presentation, uh, which is from Hong Yu Lu from the Georgia Institute of Technology. Uh, his presentation is titled The Evaluation of a Population Exposure to Travel-Related Air Pollutions by demographic characteristics using activity-based models with path retention and streamlined dispersion modeling tool. Case in Atlanta, Georgia. On you. Thanks, Ben. Uh, can you all see my uh, screen? Okay. Uh, I'm Hong Yu from uh, Georgia Institute of Technology. I'm going to be quick here. I'm not going to introduce every member in our group, but uh, I'd like to mention we have Hao Bing from University of New Mexico, and we have Dai Jing from Gongyong Wangju National University. Uh, he actually presented his uh, research yesterday. And also we're only showing the Georgia Tech logo here. We're also working with the Atlanta Regional Commission, uh, Georgia DOT and Virginia DOT. So in this research, we are presenting the development of a modeling framework for traffic-related population exposure, uh, which covers emissions modeling, dispersion modeling, and human exposure modeling. So this is basically a complete modeling chain that starts with uh, vehicle activity. So we take the uh, travel path from uh, the prediction of activity-based models, and we break them into second-by-second -second trajectories. And then we use uh, MOOS emissions rate to do the emissions and energy use modeling, and we use air model to do the concentration uh, estimation. And by pairing all these results with the demographic information at household and in individual level, we can do equity analysis, uh, like uh, comparison of inhalation versus emissions across demographic characteristics. So the ABM model we're using is uh, ARC ABM 2020, which is the same one used to develop the Transportation Improvement Program 2020. So like I said, we pair the second by second trajectories with the demographic information from ABM and licensed Ypsilon dataset. So we're using Moose matrix to do our emissions and energy use modeling, which is developed by the Georgia Tech research team uh, by running uh, all the iterations across uh, model inputs of Moose. So Moose matrix generates exactly the same output with uh, Moose 2014, but it runs 200 times faster. We're using AirMod for our dispersion modeling based on multiple source types, polygons, volume, lines, and so on. We're generating the AirMod links based on the ABM network automatically by helping. And we are also using the link screening mo um, model by uh, Daijin from Korea, which is a machine learning process to examine and filter the source receptor pairs so that we don't have to include the uh, unsensitive links or receptors. So we're doing our model runs on pay supercomputing cluster here at Georgia Tech so that we can finish the huge number of uh, link receptor pairs we're having. The case study we did was for Northwest Corridor in Atlanta metro area, which is a 24-mile uh, segment of a uh, freeway, in, including general purpose lanes and uh, managed lanes. And this is uh, still an uh, ongoing research, but we have some interesting findings along the way of our model development. First, by implementing the link screening tool, we were able to reduce the computation burden by 75%. And we also did an uncertainty assessment uh, with respect to the aggregation of input traffic operations, uh, speed, volumes, and fleet op uh, composition. Uh, this will be presented as a separate research tomorrow. And our comparison of source types in air mod suggests some significant differences across the uh, output concentrations. Uh, that's especially the case for uh, volume versus uh, the other source types. And also that's uh, the case for R-Line and R-Line XT without barriers. 
And we are also considering barrier setup in Arline XT. Uh, I know it's uh, still a beta version, but there are some limitations that we need to consider. So basically, we're um, uh, we're having this dilemma of uh, whether or not to break the air mod links so that we can match the links with the barriers. But our sensitivity analysis suggests that uh, there may be some inconsistency when we break the air mod links. So even if you're using the same emissions rate for your air mod links, the output concentration could be significantly different, especially for the over the roadway receptors. So that's something we have to figure out when we model the uh, barriers. I guess I will wrap up my uh, presentation here. The next step will be to do the uh, assessment of human exposure and the uh, equity analysis. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Hong Yu, we appreciate that. Um, and finally, we will move on to our last lightning presentation of the day. Uh, the presentation is going to be given by Olga Bredekinia from the University of Alabama, as well as Sana Rafik from the University of Alabama as well. Uh, they are presenting an overview of active transportation programs implemented between 2017 and 2020 in the United States. Hi everyone, I hope everyone can hear me. Um, my name is Sana Rafiq and my colleague Olga Bredekina and I, both of us worked on uh, this particular topic, we both work as assistant research economists at the University of Alabama, and uh, we appreciate the opportunity to present here. Um, so over the past several years, more and more state and local governments are adopting active transportation programs, uh, but there is still an existing lack of literature on this particular topic. And uh, we felt that some researching on this topic would actually contribute to the ongoing discussion about the expansion of active transportation uh, programs across the US. Active transportation is essentially uh, comprised, it comprises non-motorized modes of travel, including walking, cycling, skating, skiing, etc. It obviously provides a lot of socioeconomic benefits, including uh, improved uh, physical health, enhanced traffic safety, reduced traffic congestion, and vehicle emissions related pollution is also reduced. Our, our specific study deals with uh, uh, existing uh, nation nationwide and statewide active transportation programs uh, implemented in the US. This particular um, slide represents, uh, so we can see in the map, uh, all the trips made in, in a particular state, uh, and then the percentage, the share of uh, the trips made on bike versus uh, walking. So I know it's not very clear, we had to reduce the side of the map because it had to fit on the slide, but you can generally see that there is, there are a large number of trips that are made uh, on bike and then uh, on foot. Uh, we, so we, in this particular, uh, for our particular uh, poster, we only included a review of the current nationwide active transportation programs and statewide transportation, uh, active transportation programs. In addition to this, there was, we came across several active transportation programs that were only uh, citywide uh, and municipality wide, there would just be too many to include. So we went only with the nationwide and statewide uh, active transportation programs. I'll hand it over to Olga now. So for the nationwide uh, active transportation programs, we categorized them into uh, three uh, categories. Uh, there may be programs that focus specifically on active transportation infrastructure, and uh, particularly they help governments, local and um, state governments to uh, gain funding for um, improvement of active transportation infrastructure, such as uh, trail networks, um, bicycle facilities, storage facilities, uh, and um, similar elements of active transportation infrastructure. And the good example for 
uh, such um, prog type of program would be a rail to trail uh, conservancy. Uh, it's a nationwide program where former rails used for uh, trains that are being transformed into trails that are multi-use, could be used for uh, biking, walking, um, scooters, and stuff like that. Uh, and then other examples are uh, recreational trail programs, safe uh, routes to school uh, program, and transportation alternatives program. Those are nationwide uh, programs that are mostly funded uh, through uh, federal government funding. Uh, the second type of uh, active transportation programs that we highlighted is policy education, outreach, and advocacy programs. Uh, those are the programs that empower governments to understand um, the strengths and weaknesses of, of different active transportation uh, infrastructure situations in different um, cities and states, identify the areas for improvements and um, locate the funding sources. Example for such programs uh, are People for Bike, a Bikes program, the Bicycle Friendly America program uh, that is administered by the League of American Bicyclists and National Park Service Active Transportation Guidebook. The third category is shared micromobility programs. Uh, so those are um, prog programs that are present primarily in large metropolitan areas such as Washington DC, New York City, uh, Seattle and um, similar cities of similar size and uh, deployed micromobility programs include e-bikes, e-scooters, uh, manual bikes and other um, micromobility um, modes. For statewide active transportation programs, uh, we uh, distinguished three different types um, of programs as well. And these types, they have to uh, deal primarily with the time of when the document uh, that is explaining active transportation infrastructure within the state, when that such document was created or updated. So uh, we can see that statewide active transportation plans right now, they're not present in the majority of states. Uh, and we would say that this is the type of active transportation programs that has um, started emerging in the last, about last 10 years. So it's pretty recent. Uh, statewide bicycle and pedestrian plans, it's a different category. And those are the plans that um, very much in detail, they discuss active transportation infrastructure improvements and planning for the state. And then the third uh, category that we highlighted is long range transportation uh, plans. And we can see that um, currently there are present in quite a few states as the only active transportation document available. In those, in some of the states, we could see very detailed information about active transportation infrastructure uh, and planning, while in others, um, not very much emphasis was put on active transportation. So these categories, they highlight the gaps um, in which state there has to be more emphasis on active transportation planning. And then um, these are, this is the distribution uh, for the years when the active transportation documents were created or last updated uh, in, uh, across all the states in the US. So we can see that um, most of in most states it's been in the last um, five to ten years however there are also a few states where it's way um, the transport active transportation uh, documents they have not been updated for a while so in some states um, more attention has to be paid to that uh, and we're looking forward to seeing everyone um, that are poster during the live session Thank you so much, Olga and Sana. We really appreciate you folks uh, presenting today and uh, thank all of our presenters. Um, we sincerely appreciate all of the work that you folks are doing. 
Um, as previously mentioned, and for those that uh, might have uh, joined uh, in the middle of our presentation, uh, we're holding a live poster session starting at 1.30. Uh, and in the live poster session, you'll be able to uh, view each of our presenters' posters from today uh, and have a live video chat with those folks uh, to join a shared discussion with other individuals that join. So um, to join the live poster session, please click on the posters tab at the top of your screen in the virtual lobby. Uh, and once you click on the posters tab, you will see each of the nine posters uh, that, that we have here at the, 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 the uh, symposium. Um, and from there, you can view posters and join a live discussion to ask questions and engage further uh, with our wonderful presenters. So again, thanks so much to all of our presenters today. Excellent work. And thank you so much for those of you that were able to join. Uh, and please enjoy the live poster session. Take care.